Doctor, over here! Oh. Oh. Hold on, mate. Hold oh. on. Doctor! Come in! Uh. Oh, my God. Bloody bastards. Pull yourself together, Corporal. What? Corporal! Yes. Yes, sir. That's better. Oh. We'll have to move back. Who is against the officer? There. Oh. Like this? This hot. Good. Are you hurt? No, it's just my arm. Show me. That's not too bad. You live. No! Sir! Uh -huh. Doctor! Doctor Watson! A Study in Scarlet by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Dramatized in two parts by Bert Cools, with Clive Merrison as Sherlock Holmes and Michael Williams as Dr. John Watson. A Study in Scarlet. Part One, Revenge. The Second Afghan War brought honors and promotion to many, but for me, it had nothing but misfortune and disaster. I was shot in the shoulder at the fatal Battle of Maiwand, and worn with pain and weak from prolonged hardship, I was struck down by enteric fever, the curse of our Indian possessions. For months my life was despaired of, and when at last I came to myself, I was so weak and emaciated that not a day was lost in sending me back to England. I landed a month later on Portsmouth Jetty, with my health irretrievably ruined. I had neither kith nor kin in England, and was therefore as free as air, or as free as an army pension of eleven shillings and sixpence a day will permit a man to be. Under such circumstances, I naturally gravitated to London, that great cesspool into which all the idlers and loungers of the empire are irresistibly drained. Thank you. Here. Thank you, sir. Watson? Uh, what? John Watson? Stanforth. Good <laughs> Lord. Whatever have you been doing with yourself? You're as thin as a lath and as brown as a nut. By God, it's good to see you. Let me look at you. Ah, young Stanford. Have you eaten? No, of course you haven't. Come and lunch with me. We'll go to the Holborn. What do you say? Wounded in action, eh? Ah, in the shoulder. And then they sent you home? No, to the base hospital at Peshawar. Filthy place. Now, next to no doctors, never enough supplies. Over three quarters of the patients come down with typhoid. You too? Oh, yeah. Never rains, but it pours, eh? Oh, what do you know about it? Sitting here at home, safe and snug, it's just a game to you, isn't it? Just a damn game. Watson. I'm sorry, Stanford. My nerves are shot to pieces. It's all right, old man. You've had a hell of a time of it. Anyway. I'm glad I ran into you. And so am I. I'm afraid I've not been much of a lunch companion. Not a bit of it. Oh, what are you doing these days? Is it Dr. Stanford you? <laughs> afraid not. You're not still up at bar. The perpetual student, that's me. Damn sight better than working for a living, I tell you. <laughs> what about you? Still writing? Finished the notorious novel yet? Uh, I haven't so much as glanced at it. So what are you up to? Nothing at all, really. I've been leading a meaningless sort of existence. Where are you living? An hotel in Strand. An hotel? But isn't that rather... <laughs> rather beyond my means? Yes, it is. So, as from today, I do have an aim in life. I'm looking for new lodgings. Comfortable rooms at a reasonable price. Well, that's a strange thing. Well, what's strange about it? Well, you're the second man today who's used that expression to me. Really? Yes. The other chap had found his comfortable rooms all right. But the price was too high for him. He was looking for someone to go halves. By Jove. Who is he? Well... Stanford? A fellow who's working in the laboratory up at the hospital. You mustn't blame me if you don't get on with him. Why are you being so cagey about this man? Why shouldn't I get on with him? You don't know him yet. You might not care for him as a constant companion. Why? What is there against him? Oh, I didn't say there was anything against him. He's a little queer in his ideas. What is he? 
Medical student? I don't think so. I've no idea what he intends to go in for. Huh. A mystery man, eh? He's a first-class chemist. But a little queer in his ideas. <laughs> uh, let's see if he's in here. Oh, this setting room. Is that likely? Hmm. He was in here yesterday. Ah, oh, he isn't today. Anyway, if he's a chemist, what was he doing in there? He was beating a cadaver with a cudgel. Beating a cadaver? He told me he wanted to find out how far bruises can be produced after death. Good grief. I hope he confines that sort of thing to the hospital. If I'm going to lodge with anyone, I'd rather prefer them to be the quiet, studious type. Stamford! I found it! <laughs> Stamford! I found it! I knew I would! <laughs> Dr. Watson, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. How do you do? How are you? You've been in Afghanistan, I perceive. How on earth did you know that? <laughs> Never mind. Come and look at this. Hmm? Now, come on. I found a reagent which is precipitated by hemoglobin and nothing else. Well, you see the significance. It's interesting chemically, I suppose. Interesting. It's the most practical medico-legal discovery for years. An infallible test for blood stains. <laughs> Once blood has dried, it's impossible to tell the stains from rust or mud or fruit or a dozen other things. The only important thing about stains is getting rid of them. Who wants to tell them apart? Some of the vilest crimes of the century have gone undetected because of that very point, Stamplard. But no longer. Oh, now we have the Sherlock Holmes test. <laughs> now, now, look here. Get rid of this clutter. <coughs> Steady on it. Yes, there, there, now. Doctor, please pass me that needle. Here. Thank you. Now, let's have some fresh blood. Here. Yeah, the blood goes into a litre of water. There. The proportion can't be more than one in a million. But add some of this. Yes, and exactly three drops of this. There. I say. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. An instant reaction and quite unmistakable. And it works on old blood as well as new. The Sherlock Holmes test. Congratulations. There was a case of von Bischoff at Frankfurt last year, and, and Mason in Bradford, and the notorious Muller, and Lefebvre of Montpellier, and Samson of New Orleans. Oh, 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 if this test had been in existence then. What if it had? Well, they would most certainly all have been hung. Pass me that sticking plaster, would you, Stamford? Uh, uh, Madame Charpentier? My mother is out, sir. May I help you? Uh, my employer, Mr. Drebber, and I are looking for accommodation. Oh. Uh, two rooms, a uh, full board. Well, I'm not now, sure. Perhaps we could wait for Madame Charpentier. Oh, well, then... Yes, we'll wait. I'm sure you can uh, entertain us the meanwhile. <laughs> 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 What are these rooms like? Oh, don't concern yourself. They'll suit us down to the ground. I'm pleased to hear it. You don't object to the smell of strong tobacco, I hope. I always smoke ships myself. Well, then that, that's good enough. I generally have chemicals about and uh, occasionally do experiments. Would that annoy you? By no means. Good. Now, let me see. What are my other shortcomings? Oh, really? No, 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 no. I, <clears throat> I get in the dumps at times. And don't open my mouth for days on end. He mustn't think I'm sulky when I do that. Now, just let me learn and I'll, I'll soon be all right. Ah, very well. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> What have you to confess now, Doctor? Me? Well, it's just as well for two fellows to know the worst of one another before they begin to live together. Hmm? <coughs> come on, come on. <laughs> well, I keep a bull pup. A dog? Yeah. A friendly little chap. His name's Beecher. Beecher. Uh, what else? Ah, I object to rows. 
because my nerves are shaken. I get up at all sorts of ungodly hours and I'm extremely lazy. Yeah. I have another set of vices when I'm well, but those are the principal ones present. Do you include violin playing in your category of rows? <laughs> that depends upon the player. A well-played violin is a treat for the gods. A badly played one. Oh, that's all right then. <laughs> there you are, gentlemen. There's this room, the bedroom adjoining, and another one upstairs. Terms to include all meals and laundry. Illuminating gas is extra. Hmm. Well, Doctor. Hmm. Seems splendid so far. I'll just have a look at Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. We'll take it. I think I'll have this corner for my chemicals, if you've no objection. Oh, not in the least. Oh, what am I thinking of? But your constitution isn't up to this. No, I'm perfectly all right. Nonsense, Watson. Uh, sit down. Uh, there. Thank you. Good. Good. Oh, you, you rest for a while. The unpacking can wait. I assure you I'm fine. My dear doctor, quite apart from your generally weakened condition, your left shoulder has been seriously injured, and recently. Well, yes. Also but... your right leg, though you disguise the fact very well. So I thought. Well, an ordinary person wouldn't have noticed. <clears throat> I beg your pardon? Yes, but why conceal it at all? To be wounded in the service of one's country is not something to be ashamed of. Mm. No, you're a proud man, Doctor. The pity of others would be abhorrent to you. Hmm. Of course. Hmm. Good. Oh, really, Holmes? <coughs> Look at this. No, 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 don't get up. Have you seen the Stradivarius before, hmm? Look at that finish. <sighs> it's beautiful. Is it really genuine? I bought it for 50 shillings at a Jew broker's in the Tottenham Court Road. It's worth at least 500 guineas. <laughs> Do you like Bach? <laughs> Do you like Bach? I'd rather listen to Gilbert and Sullivan. You should have told him. Oh, I did. He carried on as if he hadn't heard a word. <laughs> and then I realised that he wasn't playing Bach anymore. It had turned into a I'm called Little Buttercup. <laughs> Look, yeah, the man's amazing. How's Beecher? Oh, fighting fit. That was damn decent of you, Watson. I've always wanted a dog. Just never got round to doing anything about it. Does he miss me, do you think? Oh, doesn't seem to. He... Oh, sorry. Didn't mean that the way it sounded. Ah, oh, don't worry. Wasn't really fair on him, state I've been in. And it would never have worked out at Baker Street anyway. <laughs> Extraordinary thing. The way he kept going by Holmes's ankles all the time. <laughs> Stanford? Hmm? Do you happen to know if he's addicted to anything? He seems like a perfectly healthy dog to me. Will you grow up? <laughs> Sorry, old man. But you did set it up rather neatly. What do you mean? Some narcotic? It doesn't strike me as likely. I've seen him lie on the sofa and not move a muscle from morning to night. And the look in his eyes... Yeah, I said he was a puzzle. How the devil did he know I'd been in Afghanistan? A good many people have wanted to know just how he finds things out. He seems to be well up on an incredible range of subjects. Uh, yesterday at dinner, I was treated to a half-hour lecture on the life of Paganini. On Tuesday, it was medieval torture devices. Mm, I bet they did wonders for your appetite. Uh, and yet, he's amazingly ignorant about some things. This morning, he actually claimed not to know that the Earth goes round the sun. You're not serious. Yeah, he got quite heated about it. What the deuce is it to me? Now that you've told me, I shall do my best to forget it. It doesn't do to crowd out useful knowledge with a lot of worthless rubbish. <sighs> I can't fathom him at all. Mm. Did you know he goes in for boxing? Boxing? Mm. He must be a damn sight stronger than he looks. And single stick and fencing. He has a shelf full of trophies. He keeps his soil and gravel samples in them. Oh, and his collection of half-smoked cigarettes. I said you might find him difficult to live with. Oh, I don't. Not really. It's just that I do like things to be orderly, everything in its place. He keeps his cigars in the coal scuttle. I can believe it. Have you found out what line he's in yet? No. 
At first, I thought he was a doctor too, or training to be one. But now, I'm not so sure. Well, have you met any of his friends? Ask one of them. I don't think he has any friends as such. But he has had a stream of visitors. You know, all different sorts. Filthy old peddler, railway port, priest. Yesterday, he saw a young lady. Oh, beautiful girl. Oh! Stanford, you have the mind of a street urchin. Uh, did he introduce you to this vision of loveliness? I remember you and the ladies. <laughs> no such luck. When Mr. Holmes has his visitors, I'm banished to my bedroom. He's very apologetic about it, mind you. Have you tried listening at the door? Oh, really? It's the only way you're going to find out what he's up to. Short of asking him to his face. Why haven't you done that, anyway? I don't want to. I want to work him out for myself. There's nothing I like better than a good mystery. Mr. Drebber. Madame Charpentier. I tell you frankly, sir, your manners towards my maidservants are disgustingly familiar. And worse, sir, you have spoken to my daughter in a way which, fortunately, she is too innocent to understand. <laughs> She's a lovely girl. Ain't the world of me. How dare you, sir? Hold your tongue, woman. Oh. Leave me alone. Oh. Ah, damn the thing. Mother. Mother, whatever's going on? Leave us, Alice. Oh, no, you don't. Oh. Come here. Now, come on, give me your Mr. Kiss. Drebber, <laughs> let go of me. <laughs> I want you out of my house, Mr. Drebber. Oh, yes? Today. You shall leave today. And think yourself lucky that my son Arthur wasn't here to see your disgusting conduct. <laughs> Why? What would he have done, huh? I must say, Holmes, you couldn't have found a place with a better cook. I haven't tasted steak and kidney pudding like that for years. <laughs> uh, some uh, brandy, Doctor? I believe I will. Thank you. As I suspect the late Mr. Hudson ate his way into an early grave. <laughs> Killing by kindness could be a, a very subtle form of murder, don't you think? What an astonishing notion. <laughs> ah, there. To your continued recovery. Thank you. Hmm. Now, let's have some music. If Bach isn't to your taste, perhaps you'd like Wagner. Hmm, Wagner. Nothing will come of nothing, Doctor. Ask me a question. I realise it's not actually any of my business, but are you studying medicine? No. Oh. Sherlock Holmes. His limits. Holmes? Knowledge of literature, nil. Knowledge of philosophy, nil. Knowledge of astronomy, nil. Knowledge of politics, feeble. I burnt that list. Not very thoroughly. Knowledge of botany, variable, well up on belladonna, opium and poisons generally, knows nothing of practical gardening. This is outrageous. <laughs> knowledge of geology, practical but limited. Knowledge of chemistry, profound. Thank you. Knowledge of anatomy, accurate but unsystematic. Knowledge of sensational literature, immense. Appears to know every detail of every horror perpetrated in the century. <laughs> you left out plays the violin well. Uh, that part you did succeed in burning. Oh, forgive me, Doctor, but I found your list as intriguing as you evidently find me. What conclusion have you drawn? I couldn't reach any conclusion. I burnt that list in frustration. <laughs> All those clues and you deduced nothing? <sighs> Not a thing. Well, well. 
have you seen this magazine? It mm. came this morning. No, no, I don't believe I have. Is there anything of interest in it? Well, look at uh, this article. A book of life. <laughs> An ambitious sort of title. The Science of Deduction and Analysis. <laughs> <laughs> Begin by mastering an elementary problem. On meeting fellow man, learn at a glance to distinguish his history and the trade or profession to which he belongs. By a man's fingernails, by his coat sleeve, by his trouser knees, by each of these things, a man's calling is plainly revealed. What ineffable twaddle. You think so? <laughs> it's unsigned. I'd like to see this fellow clapped down in a third-class carriage on the underground and asked to give the trades of all his fellow travellers. I'd lay a thousand to one against him. You'll lose your money. As for the article, I wrote it myself. You? Yes, I have a turn both for observation and deduction. The theories there are really extremely practical. So practical I depend on them for my bread and cheese. But how? What exactly do you do for a living? Ah, oh, at last, the direct question. Well, I am a consulting detective, if you can understand what that is. I suppose I'm the only one in the world. Really? Oh, yes. Well, here in London we have lots of government detectives and lots of private ones. When these fellows are at a loss, they come to me and I put them on the right scent. And how is it that you can succeed where they fail? Knowledge of sensational literature. Immense. That was very perceptive of you. I have made a particular study of the history of crime. There's a strong family resemblance about misdeeds. And if you have all the details of a thousand at your finger ends, it's odd if you can't unravel the thousand and first. Couple that with the scientific application of observation and deduction, or ineffable twaddle, as you so colourfully described it. And there you are. A consulting detective. At your service. For a fee, of course. And some of your clients are policemen? Oh, quite so. Well, one fellow's been here several times. Oh, yes, you introduced me. Um, Lestrade, a little sallow man, rat-faced. Yeah, I see you have the knack for observation yourself. He's a well-known detective, Scotland Yard, and got himself into a fog recently over a forgery case. I solved it for him. And the others? Mostly sent on by private inquiry agencies. And you solve their problems without leaving this room? Mm, as usually, now and again a case turns up which is a, a little more complex, then I have to bustle about and see things with my own eyes. Oh, it's fantastic. Not at all. When we first met, I told you that you'd been in Afghanistan. A lucky guess. Oh, I try never to guess. Oh, no, it's a shocking habit. Now, I knew it. Now, let's see if I can give you the, the line of reasoning. Here is a gentleman of a medical type with the air of a military man, an army doctor, then. He's just come from the tropics, for his face is dark, and that is not the natural colour of his skin, for his wrists are fair. He has undergone hardship and sickness, and has recently been seriously injured in at least two places. Where could an English army doctor have seen such trials? Clearly, in Afghanistan. <laughs> The whole train of thought didn't occupy a second. I put the conclusion into words, and you were astonished. <laughs> uh, oh. Good night, Doctor. He was a terrible man, Arthur. Well, why not? didn't you throw him out earlier, Mother? They were paying £14 a week. And this the slack season. I thought I was acting for the best. It's all right. He's gone now. I wish I'd been here. Oh, please, Arthur, let's forget about it. Now, who on earth can that be at this hour? I'll go. Well, there's no need. Jenny's still up. Hello, Jenny. Oh, no. Is it him? Is it Trevor? Good evening, ladies. I thought I told you <laughs> oh, that you were surprised not... to see me, are you? <laughs> I've come to take your little Alice away oh, with no. me. Ah, you live like a princess. <laughs> come here and kiss me. No. Oh, come on. No. Come on. No. <laughs> well, who's there? Take this for a kiss. Oh. Oh. Outside <laughs> with you. <laughs> come on, get out. Oh. <laughs> Now, you be 
listen to me, Trevor. If you dare to show your face in our house again, I'll kill you. Do you hear me? And this thing to help you remember. I mean it, Trevor. I'll kill you. But today? I was right. You do have a talent for observation. I trust you've left me some coffee. Anything interesting in the paper? <coughs> Evidently not. There are no crimes and no criminals these days. What's the use of having brains in my profession? I know well that I have it in me to make my name famous. No man has ever lived who's brought the same amount of study and natural talent to the detection of crime as I have done. I believe you. And what's the result? There's no crime to detect, or at most some bungling villainy so transparent that even a Scotland Yard official can see through it. <clears throat> this coffee's cold. I'll ring for some more. I wonder what he's looking for. Mm. Who? Just crossing the street. See? <sighs> oh, you mean the retired sergeant of marines? Brag of bunch! That's a pure guess and a safe one, too. You know perfectly well. I've no way of verifying it. On the contrary. I believe you'll have every chance. Listen. Retired sergeant of marines, eh? Undoubtedly. <laughs> Come in. A person to see you, Mr. Holmes. Yeah, thank you, Mrs. Hudson. This way, gentlemen. I have a letter for Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Ah, thank you. Good day, gentlemen. Oh, one moment, my man. Sir? May I ask what your trade may be? Commissioner, sir. Uniform away for repairs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir? And you were? A sergeant, sir. Royal Marine Light Infantry. Thank you, sergeant. Yeah. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Good day. How in the world did you deduce that? Deduce what? Uh, excuse me, you, you broke the thread of my thoughts. I'm sorry, but it was wonderful. Uh, uh, oh, commonplace. Great blue anchor tattooed on the back of his hand, military bearing, air of command, a dozen other details. Oh, look at this note. Oh. Thank you. I said just now there were no criminals. It appears that I was wrong. This is terrible. It does seem to be a little out of the common. Out of the common? A man bearing no sign of a wound found dead in a pool of blood. In an empty house in Brixton. Who is this Tobias Gregson? The smartest of the Scotland Yarders. And he's come to you for help? Oh, he and Lestrade are the pick of a bad lot, and they have their knives into one another. <laughs> They're as jealous as a pair of professional beauties. <laughs> Oof, there'll be some fun in this case if they're both put on the scent. <laughs> Watson? Oh, surely there's not a moment to be lost. I'll order you a cab. Oh, well, I, I'm not sure about whether I shall go. What? It's just a chance you've been longing for. Oh, my dear fellow, what does it matter to me? Supposing I do unravel the problem, Gregson and Lestrade and company will pocket all the credit. That comes of being an unofficial person. But he begs you to help him. Yes, well, he knows that I'm his superior and acknowledges it to me, but he'd cut his tongue out before owning it to a third person. <laughs> Mm. Uh, however, we may as well go and have a look. I may have a laugh at them, if I have nothing else. <laughs> mm. uh, right, come on. Your hat, come on. You wish me to come? Yeah. Uh, if you've nothing better to do. Sorry, gents. Can't go in there. Good morning, Constable. We are here at Inspector Gregson's invitation. Oh, beg your pardon, sir. You'll find him inside, with Inspector Lestrade. Oh, excellent. <laughs> sir? Nothing. Come along, Watson. Thank you, Constable. Sir? Holmes? Shh, shh, shh. Sorry. Yeah. 
What is it? Have you found something? Yes, exactly what I was expecting to find. Ah, footprints. <laughs> Watson. Yes? This may not be pleasant. Are you sure your nerves can take it? I wouldn't miss this for the world. Good man. Ah, Gregson. Mr. Holmes, it's kind of you to come. Inspector Tobias Gregson, Dr. John Watson. Good day, Doctor. Inspector? I'll be glad of an expert medical opinion. Oh, come in, gentlemen. I've left everything untouched. Except that. Mr. Holmes? The pathway man. Ever heard of buffaloes and passed along it? There can be a greater mess. Well, I've had so much to do inside the house. I had relied on Mr. Lestrade to look after the path. Yeah, of course. Did you come here in a cab, Gregson? No, sir. Nor Lestrade? No, sir. Ah. Then let us go and look at this unfortunate individual. Have you found out who the poor fellow was yet, Inspector? Yes, we have, Doctor. He was an American, seemingly. Name of Drebber. Enoch J. Drebber. Thank you, Mr. Lestrade. Mr. Gregson. Mm. Good morning, Mr. Holmes. Lestrade. I didn't expect to see you here, Doctor. Good morning, Inspector. Well, I suppose there's no harm. It's this room, gentlemen, but before you go in, perhaps I should warn you. It's not exactly pretty. Yes, yes, Lestrade. Good God. Fascinating. This case will make a stir, mark my words. It beats anything I've seen, and I'm no chicken. I agree with Lestrade. This is a nasty business. Come, Doctor, to work. You're quite sure there's no wound? Positive. Uh, and yet there's blood everywhere. It reminds me of the death of Van Janssen in Utrecht in the year 34. Remember the case, Gregson? Uh, no, sir. Read it up. You really should. There's nothing new under the sun. What do you think, Mr. Holmes? Don't really restrain. I've just walked in the door. Doctor. Yes? I wonder if you'd oblige me by taking a few notes. Notes? It would be of enormous assistance. Then I'd be glad to. Use my notepad. Uh, you have a, a pencil? Yes. Excellent. Gregson, with your permission, I shall examine the body. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Lestrade. Mr. Holmes. Be so good as to hold my hat. <clears throat> <clears throat> now, let's see. Yes, yes, yes. Hmm. Now, this is the body of a man about 43 or 44 years of age. Mm -hmm. Middle size. Hmm. Broad-shouldered, well-dressed, immaculate collar and cuffs. <laughs> uh, hmm. Patent leather boots, hmm. size ten. A top hat on the floor beside him. Huh. Body curiously twisted, hands clenched, legs interlocked. Yes, Holmes. Smell his lips. Good Lord. Quite so. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, he's not been moved at all. No more than we had to, to examine him properly. Yes, of course. The strayed. Give me a hand to turn him over. Right. <sighs> a ring. I was caught up in the folds of his jacket. Got it. This is a woman's wedding ring. There's been a woman here. Oh, this complicates matters. Heaven knows they were complicated enough before. You're sure it doesn't simplify them? Hmm? But there's nothing to be learned by staring at it. What did you find in his pockets? Uh, we have it all here. Ah, more notes, if you please, Doctor. <laughs> hmm. a gold watch, gold ring, gold pin with rubies. Hmm. Whatever the motive was, it certainly wasn't robbery. Yes. Russian leather card case. With visiting cards of Enoch J. Drebber of Cleveland, USA. And two letters, one addressed to E.J. Drebber and the other two, 
Joseph Stangerson. At what address, the Strand? American Exchange, the Strand, be called for. Have you made any inquiries as to this man Stangerson, Gregson? I did so at once. <clears throat> Indeed, Lestrand. Advertisements in all newspapers and a man sent to the American Exchange. No information yet. Uh, have you sent to Cleveland? I telegraphed this morning. How did you word your inquiries? I simply detailed the circumstances. Did there nothing else? Is there no single factor upon which this whole case appears to hinge? <laughs> Will you not telegraph again? I've said all I have to say. <laughs> Mr. Gregson! Hmm? Gentlemen, I have just made a discovery of the highest importance. Oh, yes? Yes. Pray, look over here. This is the darkest part of the room, but observe this candle stub on the shelf. When it was burning, this area of the wall would have been clearly lit. Now, what do you make of that? Good God. Is that blood? Yes. R A C H E. Written in letters of blood. Rach. A most important clue. Well, what does it mean now that you've found it? Rach. It means that the writer was going to put the female name Rachel, but was disturbed before he or she had time to finish. You mark my words. A woman named Rachel has something to do with all this. <laughs> oh, it's all very well for you to laugh, Mr. Holmes. But the old hound is the best when all said and done. Uh, I really do beg your pardon, Lestrade. You deserve the credit for having found it. <laughs> now, with your permission, I'll examine the room now. I've already done so. Now, carry on, Mr. Holmes. Thank you. He won't find anything else. <sighs> I'll bet my pension. Ah, oh, look at him sniffing around. <laughs> uh, no disrespect intended, Doctor, but there's a right way and a wrong way to go about this sort of work. Yes, I'm sure there is. <laughs> Have you known him long, Doctor? Hmm? Long enough to know that he does nothing without some definite purpose. <clears throat> ah, Mr Holmes, uh, what do you think? Uh, it would be robbing you of the credit if I were to presume to help you. Yeah. You too are... I'm doing so well. <laughs> but I should like to speak to the constable who found the body. Uh, John Rance. He's off duty now. I have a note of his home address. Um, here you are, Doctor. Thank you, Inspector. Ah, come along, Watson. We'll look him up. I'll tell you one thing which may help you in the case. Oh, yes? There has been a murder done, and the murderer was a man. He was more than six feet high, was in the prime of life, had small feet for his height, wore coarse, square-toed boots and smoked a Trichinopoly cigar. He came here with his victim in a four-wheeled cab, which was drawn by a horse with three old shoes and a new one on his off foreleg. In all probability, the murderer had a florid face and the fingernails of his right hand were remarkably long. These are only a few indications, but they may assist you. If this man was murdered, how was it done? Poison. Poison? Oh, and one other thing, Lestrade. Don't waste your time looking for Miss Rachel. Rache is the German word for revenge. <laughs> Good morning. It seems obvious once you've explained it. Oh. Hmm. I can understand how you knew about the cab and its horse from the signs in the mud, and how you calculated the height of the murderer from the length of his stride. I was right about the footprints. You were right about the footprints. But well, what about his age? In the prime of life, you said. Well, if a man can step four and a half feet without the smallest effort, he can't be quite in the sear and the yellow. There's no mystery about it. Hmm. The abnormally long fingernails? Yeah, the writing on the wall was done with a man's forefinger dipped in blood. The scratches made by his nail were unmistakable, as was the wholly distinctive ash which had dropped from his Trichinopoly cigar. <laughs> oh, I flatter myself that I can distinguish at a glance the ash of any known brand of cigar or tobacco. Good Lord. You said the murderer had a florid face. No, I said that there was a strong probability of it, which is not the same thing. My head's in a whirl. Raka, revenge. 
Are we looking for a German assassin? I'm not going to tell you anything more, Doctor. Oh. You know, a conjurer gets no credit once he's explained his tricks. If I show you too many of my methods, you'll conclude that I'm a very ordinary individual after all. Oh, never. You have brought detection as near an exact science as it ever will be brought in this world. <laughs> I'll tell you one more thing I read from the footprints. The two men came in the same cab and they walked down the path as friendly as possible, arm in arm in all probability. Arm in arm? Yes, once they get inside, patent leathers, the victim stood still and square toes walked up and down the room getting more and more excited. Then the tragedy occurred. We must hurry up. I want to go to a concert this afternoon. I'll tell it you from the beginning, sir. My time is from ten at night till six in the morning. At eleven, uh, there was a fight at the White Art, but by that it was quite enough on the beat. About two, or maybe a little after, I thought I'd take a bit of a look around down the Brixton Road. It was precious, dirty and lonely. Not a soul did I see, barring a cab or two. I was strolling down, thinking between ourselves how uncommon Andy a four a gin ought to be, when suddenly the glint of a light caught my eye, and that house, what I knew was empty on account of him that owns it, won't have the drain seat to, even though the last tenant what lived there died of the typhoid fever. Yes. The door was unlocked. I pushed it open and went into the front room, where there was the stub of a candle burning. In the light of the candle, I saw... Well, you know what I saw... I went back to the gate and sounded my rattle, and that brought Ted Murcher from the Olin Grove beat. Apart from the two of us, the street was empty. Well, empty as far as anybody that could be of any good goes. <laughs> I've seen many a drunk chap in my time, but never anyone as crying drunk as that cove. He was at the gate when I come out, leaning up against the railings and singing at the pitch of his lungs. He could hardly stand. <laughs> I can see him now, clear as day, great tall chap with his long red face. <laughs> Constable and... Rance. Uh, sir? What became of this man? Oh, I'd quite enough to do without looking after him. Oh, I'll wager he found his way home all right. The blundering fool to think of his having such an incomparable stroke of luck and not taking advantage of it. It's true that his description of the drunk tallies with your idea of the murderer. Tallies? That drunk was the murderer. But why should he come back to the house after leaving it? That's not the way of criminals. The ring, man, the ring. That's what he came back for. If we have no other way of catching him, we can always bait our line with a ring. <laughs> I shall have him, Doctor. I'll lay you two to one. Uh, no bet. I must thank you. For what? I might not have gone, but for you. I might have missed the finest study I ever came across. <laughs> a study in Scarlet. Eh? A study in scarlet. Yeah. Why shouldn't we use a, a little art jargon? There's the scarlet thread of murder running through the colourless skein of life, and our duty is to unravel it and isolate it and expose every inch of it. But now I must send a telegram, and then lunch, I think, and then for Madame Norman Neruda. Her attack and Boeing are splendid. What's that little thing she plays so magnificently? I, um, I don't believe I know it. I'll teach you to overdo things, Doctor. Chasing about London after German subversives. <sighs> Come in. Oh, good afternoon, Doctor. I thought I heard you come back. I just wanted to see if dinner at the usual time would be convenient. <clears throat> Why, Dr. Watson, whatever is the matter? Nothing, Mrs. Hudson, nothing at all. Nonsense. Come over here and sit down this minute. You look exhausted. My dear lady, I assure uh, don't you... Don't you try to sweet-talk me, young man. I'm not some slip of a thing you can get around just like that. Mrs. Hudson. Yes, well, I dare say it's worked with a good few before now, but I've seen something of life, and I know a sick man when I see one. Mm -hmm. Now, are you going to sit down, Doctor, or are you going to be stubborn and stand there pretending until you fall down? 
I'm sorry, Mrs. Hudson. You're quite right. Uh, that's better. I'll get you some chamomile tea. And while I'm doing it, you can put your feet up. Here, let me help you. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> oh, I, I do beg your pardon. Try to get some sleep. I dare say he won't be back for hours yet. What is it this time? The hospital again? Another stroll around the East End? Oh, violin concert. St. James's Hall, I think. He's one of a kind, your friend. No, I'll see to your tea. You get some sleep. Yeah, you wouldn't believe the morning I've heard, Mrs. Hudson. I dare say not. Sleep now. Uh, I don't think I could. <laughs> it's too much excitement, you see. Too much excitement. Watson, quite magnificent. Do you remember what Darwin says about music? Oh, uh, what? He claims that the power of producing and appreciating it existed among the human race long before the power of speech was arrived at. Perhaps that's why we are so subtly influenced by it. Yes, there are vague memories in our souls of those misty centuries when the world was in its childhood. Uh, it's rather a broad idea. Well, one's ideas must be as broad as nature if one's to interpret nature. <laughs> oh. What's the matter? You're not looking quite yourself. This Brixton Road affair has upset you. Uh, to tell you the truth, it has. I ought to be more case-hardened after my Afghan experiences. I saw my own comrades hacked to death at my wand without losing my nerve. But I just can't shake off the image of that twisted body in that terrible room. I can understand. There's a mystery about this which stimulates the imagination, and imagination is the breeding ground of horror. Hmm. Uh, have you seen the evening papers? No. Well, they, they give a fairly good account of the affair, but none of them mention the ring. Uh, just as well. Why? Well, Look at this announcement in the found column. Um, there. Found in the Brixton Road this morning, a plain gold wedding ring. Mm, there's a copy of that in every evening paper. Apply between 8 and 9 tonight to Dr J. Watson. Yes, excuse me copy. using your name. If I use my own, some of these dunderheads would recognise it and want a medal in the affair. Yeah. Oh, that's all right. But suppose somebody answers. I have no ring. Oh, yes, you have. Here. And this is almost a facsimile. Ah. Who do you expect will come? Why? Our florid friend with the square toes. The murderer? Well, why should he fear a trap? Well, you shall see him within the hour. And then? Well, you can leave me to deal with him. Uh, have you any weapons? My old service revolver and a few cartridges. Hmm. Oh, you'd better clean and load it. Hmm. It's as well to be ready for anything. Now put your pistol in your pocket. Speak to him in an ordinary way. Don't frighten him. <laughs> Don't frighten him. Holmes... Is Mrs. Hudson safe? Perfectly. This man is a calculating murderer, not a madman who strikes out at random. I asked her to send him up alone and then lock herself and the maid in the kitchen. Now, here he is. Remember, do nothing to make him suspicious. He's already killed one man. Come in. Dr. Watson? Yes, madam? I've come about the ring. 
What o'clock did you return here last night? I've told you, I can't remember. You admit to assaulting the man? Yes, yes. How many more times? And then you left him lying in the gutter and just walked away. Can you produce any witnesses to support this story? Other than members of your family, I mean? I thought I heard a cab. You thought you heard a cab? Well, the cabby may have seen us. I don't know. Hmm. Arthur Charpentier, I'm placing you under arrest for the willful murder of one Enoch J. Drebber of the United States of America. Take him away. Oh, bless you, sir. You've done a Christian deed this day. We never thought to see this ring again. That we didn't. I'm pleased to have been of service, Mrs. Sawyer. Good evening to you. And to you, Doctor. My Sally will be a glad woman this night. The Lord be praised. God bless you. And you too, sir. Uh, good night. Good night. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry, but to look on your face, I'd have given a thousand pounds for a camera and some flash powder. Uh, <laughs> oh, 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 look, I'm sorry you were wrong about the ring. <laughs> Obviously, Trevor just picked it up in the street where that poor old thing's daughter lost it. Uh, what are you doing? Following her, of course. That feeble old woman. Holmes! Wait up, Bobby! <laughs> Who's there? Easy, Watson. Uh, Holmes? What time is it? Uh, just before midnight. Do you mind if I light the lamp? Oh, my apologies. Uh, no, no, it's all right. Have you just got back? Uh, yes. Oh, what on earth happened? <laughs> Holmes? Don't be so infuriated. <laughs> <laughs> what the devil? Oh, I wouldn't have a Scotland Yard as know it for all the world. <laughs> They'd never let me hear the end of it. What? <laughs> the end of what? Uh, oh, 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 very well. I, I don't mind telling a story against myself. Uh, that creature hobbled a little way and then began to limp. She hailed a four-wheeler. I tried to get near enough to catch the address, but I needn't have bothered. She sang it out loud enough to be heard the other side of the street. <laughs> 13 Duncan Street, Hounds Ditch. That's the address she gave me? Yes. Oh, this begins to look genuine, I thought. So what did you do? I perched myself on the back of the cab, out of sight. You did what? Oh, it's an art every detective should be an expert at. Well, a wavy rattle and never drew rain till we got there. I hopped off just before we came to the door and strolled down the street. The cab pulled up, the driver jumped down, and nothing came out. But what had happened to me? When I reached the driver, he was groping about frantically in the empty cab and giving vent to the finest collection of oaths that ever I listened to. <laughs> but what had happened to Mrs. Sawyer? <laughs> uh, uh, I inquired at number 13. Uh, the house belongs to a respectable paper hanger called Keswick. Keswick? Keswick. No Mrs. Sawyer had ever been heard of there. You mean to say that that tottering, feeble old woman was able to get out of the cab while it was going along without either you or the driver seeing her? Uh, old woman be damned. <laughs> oh, we were the old women to be taken in. Oh, it must have been a, a, a young man and an active one too, besides being an incomparable actor. The disguise was superb. Yes. Now, Doctor, you're looking done up. Yeah. I'm afraid I am. Take my advice and turn in. Uh, I won't disturb you. You're not retiring? No. No. I want to think. Good night, then. Yeah. I left him in the dim light of the lamp, seated in front of the smouldering fire, 
wrapped in an old mouse-coloured dressing gown, his eyes fixed vacantly upon the corner of the room and his long legs stretched out across the hearth. Long into the watches of the night, I heard the slow, melancholy wailing of his violin. After much fruitless racking of my brain, I had finally discovered that my new fellow lodger, Sherlock Holmes, a man of singular talents, enthusiasms and areas of ignorance, was in fact what he termed a consulting detective. I have it in me, he told me modestly, to make my name famous. All he lacked was the proper opportunity. I was convinced, though Holmes was not, that this opportunity had at last arrived with the invitation by no less a personage than Inspector Tobias Gregson of Scotland Yard to investigate the bizarre murder of one Enoch J. Drebber. On the day following the killing, the papers were full of the Brixton mystery. <laughs> Listen to this one. Hmm? The German name of the murdered man, the absence of all other motive, and the sinister inscription, Raka, revenge, written upon the wall, all point to political refugees and revolutionists, <laughs> the socialists of many branches in America. <laughs> Don't tell me. The Daily Telegraph. Oh, very good, Watson. <laughs> the piece also mentions the Weingericht, Aqua Tofana, the Carbonari, the Marchioness de Bronvilliers, the Darwinian theory, the principles of Malthus, and the Radcliffe Highway murders. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what, what do you have? Uh, the standard. Lawless outrages of this sort usually occur under a liberal government. <laughs> they arise from the unsettling of the minds of the masses and the consequent weakening of all authority. Very <laughs> true. There, oh, and some new facts. Oh, good heavens. The deceased was an American gentleman. Oh, that's hardly new. Even the strayed and Gregson discovered that. <laughs> who had been residing at the boarding house of Madame Charpentier in Camberwell with his private secretary, Mr Joseph Stangerson. So, the mysterious Stangerson has been identified. Uh, someone's been busy. Probably Gregson. <laughs> ah! Mm. We are glad to learn that Mr. Gregson and Mr. Lestrade of Scotland Yard are both engaged on the case. It is confidently anticipated that these two well-known officers will speedily throw light on the matter. <laughs> Which one's that? Uh, daily news. I told you that whatever happened, those two would be certain to score. Nah, that depends on how it turns out. Oh, bless you. It doesn't matter in the least. If the man is caught, it'll be on account of their exertions. If he escapes, it'll be in spite of their exertions. A fool can always find a bigger fool to admire him, <laughs> as the old French poet said. <laughs> hmm. Holmes? Hmm, my dear fellow? Hmm. You seem highly delighted by the telegram this morning. What was in it? Oh, that. The name of the murderer. Should we order some more toast? Mr. Holmes. Mrs. Hudson, have you added mind reading to your many other accomplishments? Mr. Holmes, I really must protest. What do you think you're doing inviting me? Mr. Holmes! Mr. Holmes, in all my years I have never witnessed such a display. Silence in the ranks. Mrs. Hudson, may I present the Baker Street Division of the Detective Police Force? Oh. In future, you must wait in the street. Wiggins, you can come up alone to report. Yes, sir. <laughs> now, was there anything else, Mrs. Hudson? There was not. <laughs> right. Have you found it yet? No, sir, we ain't. Well, you must keep on until you do. Here are your wages. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, go, go, and bring back a better report next time. Yes, yes sir. All right, you lot. Come on. Hold it. Put them back, Vicky. I ain't got nothing. Vicky? That's better. So long, gents. Ah, there's more work to be got out of those little beggars than out of a dozen of the regular force. <laughs> they can go everywhere and hear everything. All they want is organisation. You're employing them on this Brixton case? Yes, there's something I want to track down. It's only a matter of time. Do you really know the name of the murderer? Oh, hello. We're going to hear some news now with a vengeance. Here's Gregson coming down the road with beatitude written upon every feature of his face. 
It's all right, Mrs. Hudson. The gentleman's expected. My dear Holmes, congratulate me. I've made the whole thing as clear as day. Uh, he, oh, uh, Doctor. Good morning. Do you mean that you're on the right track? The right track? Why, sir, I have the man under lock and key. And his name? Arthur Charpentier. Oh. Uh, take a seat, Gregson. Oh, uh, you know, try one of these cigars. Yes, oh. We're anxious to know how you managed it, aren't we, Watson? Oh, well, yes. Of course we are. <laughs> <laughs> the fun of it is that that foolish trade has gone off on the wrong track altogether. <laughs> He's chasing after the secretary, Stangerson. <laughs> but he had no more to do with a cry than a babe unborn. <laughs> Lestrade's probably arrested him by now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <coughs> My dear oh, Gregson. Uh, oh, thank you, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> How exactly did you get your clue? Yeah, oh, well, now, I'll tell you all about it. Yeah, of course, gentlemen, this is strictly between ourselves. Of course. Oh, yeah. Well, the first difficulty was the tracing of this Drebber's movements prior to his murder. Now, you may not remember it, but there was a hat Lying beside the body. Yes, made by John Underwood and Sons, 129 Camberwell Road. Oh. Oh, I'd no idea you'd notice that. Have you been there? No. Ah, no, you should never neglect a clue, however small it may seem. To a great mind, nothing is little. Yeah, exactly. Well, I went to Underwood and Sons and had them checked back in their books. Now, that hat was bought by a Mr. Drebber and was delivered. That's how I got his address. Smart, very smart. I called upon Madame Charpentier. You know that feeling, Mr. Holmes, when you come up on the right scent, a kind of thrill in your nerves? I do indeed. Yes? May I help you? I found her very pale and distressed. I began to smell a rat. Mother, who is it? The daughter also looked extremely red about the eyes. I determined to be direct with them. I am a police officer. Have you heard of the mysterious death of your late boarder, Mr. Enoch J. Drebber? Admirably direct, Gregson. Yes. Yes, we have. From the evening paper. Oh, it's quite exciting. What happened next? At what o'clock did Mr. Drebber leave your establishment yesterday? At eight o'clock. And was that the last you saw of him? Yes. No. No, it wasn't. Alice. No good can ever come of falsehood, Mother. Let us be frank with this gentleman. We did see Mr. Drebber again. God forgive you. You have murdered your brother. I persuaded Madame Charpentier to make a clean breast of the facts. Now, apparently, this Drebber was a bit of a bad lot, and he and Stangerson were ordered off the premises. The Drebber had returned roaring drunk and made obscene advances towards her daughter. This was witnessed by the son, Arthur Charpentier, who soundly trounced the American and threw him out of the house. Uh, surely, Inspector, that's exactly what one would have expected him to do. Oh, yes, 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 Doctor, of course. But then this Arthur followed Drebber out into the street to send him on his way. Now, both the mother and the daughter clearly heard the son's words. And they were? I mean it, Drebber, I'll kill you. The son didn't return to the house until the early hours of the morning. What is his version of events? Oh, some cock and bull story about just walking away and leaving Drebber lying in the gutter. Were there any witnesses? No, none we can trace. Oh, Charpentier thinks he may have heard a cab. Ah! Oh, well done, Gregson. This is vital information. You really are getting along. <laughs> we shall make something of you yet. <laughs> I flatter myself that I've managed it rather neatly. The whole case fits together uncommonly well. Did you say you've arrested Charpentier? Yes, late last evening. No doubt he'll sing a different song after spending the night as a guest of Her Majesty. Perhaps. <laughs> oh, I can't wait to see that fool Lestrade's face. <laughs> <laughs> Come in, Lestrade. He what? Inspector Lestrade, gentlemen. Oh, 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 by Joe. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Good morning, Mr. Holmes. Gentlemen. Is everything all right, Inspector? Oh, this is a most extraordinary case. A most incomprehensible affair. Oh, you think so, do you, Lestrade? Have you managed to find the secretary, Mr. Joseph Stangerson? Uh, the secretary, Mr. Joseph Stangerson, was murdered about six o'clock this morning. Stangerson murdered too? Are you sure? Extremely sure. It was I who discovered the body at Halliday's private hotel, Gower Street. Take a seat, Lestrade. Thank you. 
I, I knew that both Americans were intending to sail home from Liverpool, and I reasoned that Stangerson might still be planning to do so. That meant taking a Euston train. I and my men made inquiries at all the private hotels in the area of the station. But there must be over a hundred. Yes, but I tracked him down about seven o'clock this morning. It's very early, sir. He'll see me. Are you the gentleman he's been expecting, then? I doubt it. Which room is it? Here we are, sir. Number 23. Right. You can go now. <laughs> oh, God! What's the matter? Have you got a pass key? Look, look, what's going on? Who are you? I'm a police officer. Stand back! What? <laughs> oh, my God! I'd seen something that made me feel sick, in spite of my 20 years' experience. A, a, a little red ribbon of blood was flowing out from under the door. It had meandered across the passage and formed a pool along the skirting at the other side. And inside the room? Uh, the window was open, and beside it, all huddled up, was the body of a man lying in a pool of blood. The porter identified him as Stangerson. B but the strangest part of the whole affair, what do you suppose was above the murdered man? The word Raka. Written in letters of blood. Exactly as before. Yeah. Was everything the same, Lestrade? Uh, not quite. This one had been stabbed. Stabbed? A deep wound in the left side. Stabbed. Something must have gone wrong. Oh, I've arrested an innocent man. My suspect was under lock and key at the very moment the real villain was killing again. Yeah, don't reproach yourself, Gregson. Your case was basically quite sound. This time, the murderer was seen. You have a witness? Yes. A milk boy saw a man climbing down a ladder at the back of the hotel. He was so open about it that the lad took him for a workman. Did you get a description? The man was unusually tall, well-built, and had a, a reddish face, exactly as you said he would be, Mr Holmes. Yes. Did you find anything significant in the room? Nothing. Stangerson's cases were packed. They'd been sent to the yard. There were just a few items lying loose. Uh, here. One cheap novel, which was open on the bedside table. One pipe and one box of matches. They were on a chair. Mm. The only other thing was a small ointment box containing a couple of pills. Here. <sighs> the last link. My case is complete. There, there you are, old girl. Ah, easy. You won't have to put up with me much longer, I reckon. You ready? Well, off we go, then. Hey, Cabby! Cabby! Wait, mister! Ho! Oh, oh, girl! Oh. Oh. oh, thanks, mister. Well, what do you want, boy? The governor in the office said your name's Hope. Jefferson Hope. Well, what if it is? There's a gent got a job for you. Good money in it, he said. Was it some kind of joke? No, honest, mister. I better not be. All right, where does he live? This gent of yours. Baker Street, 221B, Baker Street. Here's the poor creature, doctor. You can see he's suffering. Mm. I tell the maid I'd ask you to put him out of his misery. She's down there now, sobbing her heart out. She really loves this old dog. <coughs> Don't worry, Mrs. Hudson. He won't suffer much longer. Thank you, sir. I'll go and tell the girl. Oh, e easy, boy. Oh, poor old fellow. Now, look, Mr. Holmes, what exactly is all this about? Why have you sent for this animal? Patience, my friend. I now have in my hands all the threads which have formed such a tangle. I am as certain of the main facts as if I had seen them with my own eyes. I will give you a proof of my knowledge. Uh, doctor, are these ordinary pills? Here. No. No, they're not. They're unusually light and transparent. Probably soluble in water. I couldn't really say any more without a proper analysis. I believe we have a quicker method to hand. I shall cut one of the pills in two and put one half safely back in its box. Now, if we put a little water in this saucer, then you will perceive that the doctor is right and the half pill readily dissolves in it. Mr Holmes, this may be very interesting, but I cannot see what it has to do with this case. It has everything to do with it. I shall now add a little milk to the mixture to make it palatable. Now, I'm presenting it... To the dog, 
we find that he laps it up quickly enough. Hmm. Now. Holmes? If you'll excuse us, Mr. Holmes, my colleague and I have a murderer to track down. Wait! It can't be a coincidence. It's impossible that it should be a coincidence. The very pills which I suspected in the case of Drebber are actually found after the death of Stangerson, and yet they're inert. What can it mean? What can it mean? Ah! Oh, I have it! I have it! The other pill! The other pill. Cut it in two. More water. Yes, dissolve it. Milk. Stir. Right. Here you are, boy. Try this. Look, Watson. Look, Gregson. Lestrade. What's the matter with the animal? Ha <laughs> ha! It's dead! It's dead! My <laughs> God! Good Lord. Poor creature. Of the two pills in the box, one was the most deadly poison and the other was entirely harmless. Oh, I ought to have known that before ever I saw the box at all. I'll have that pill box back, if you please. And now look here, Mr Holmes, we are all ready to acknowledge that you're a smart man and have your own methods of working, but we want something more than theory and preaching now. It's a question of taking the man. Gregson made his case out and he was wrong. I went after my man, Stangerson, and I was wrong too. You've thrown out hints here and hints there, but can you name the man who did it? Any delay in arresting the killer might give him time to strike again. The doctor's quite right, sir. There will be no more murders. You can put that consideration out of the question. You ask me if I know the name of the assassin. I do. Then it's well, your duty to... The mere knowing of his name is a small thing, however, compared with the power of laying our hands upon him. Give us the name, Mr. Holmes! If this man gains the slightest suspicion that the official force is onto him, he would change his name and vanish in an instant. You would be powerless to trace him. And now look here, sir. This is not good enough. You must give us the name. No. I cannot. Yes, what is it, Mrs. Hudson? Someone for you, Mr. Holmes. Beg pardon, sir. Oh, really? Yes, Wiggins. I've got a cab downstairs. Oh, good boy. Here. Oh, thanks, sir. Uh, the cabman may as well help me with the boxes, sir. Ask him to step up, Wiggins. Yeah, right away, sir. What's this about, Mr. Holmes? I hope you're not planning to leave the capital. <laughs> uh, doctor, be so good as to fetch my handcuffs. Your handcuffs? In my writing desk, right hand drawer. Oh, certainly. Mm. Here you are. Mr. Holmes. Why don't you introduce this pattern at Scotland Yard? Look, they fasten in an instant. The old pattern's quite good enough if we can only find the right pair of wrists to put them on. <laughs> very good, very good. Uh, excuse me, gentlemen, while I just strap up this portmanteau. Mr. Holmes? Ah, Tabby. Ah, just give me a help with this buckle, would you? Uh, move aside, sir. Now let me do it. Oh. I, uh, what? Gentlemen, let me introduce you to Mr. Jefferson Hope, the murderer of Enoch Ribber and of Joseph Stangerson. No! Uh, stop him! Oh, no, you don't. Uh, hold him still. I've got his legs. I've got him. I've got him. I've got him. Now, Mr. Hope, I have no desire to do so. I assure you that I'm quite capable of breaking your arm if you render it necessary. <laughs> Let me go. I know any odds against me. Very well. Uh, uh, now, these two gentlemen are police uh, officers. And as soon as one of them regains his breath, I'd rather fancy you're going to find yourself under arrest. Are you all right up there, Lestrade? Everything well under control. <laughs> if he ever leaves the force, he's got a second career ready and waiting. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> are you in much pain? No one worse. Mr. Holmes, is it? Sherlock Holmes. Well, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, if there's a vacant place for a chief of the police, I reckon you're the man for it. <laughs> it's quite enough from you, Hope. Oh, really, Gregson? <clears throat> yeah, it was the ring that gave it to me, of course. That and the wheel marks in the mud of the Brixton Road. <laughs> If that night had been dry, I never would have found you, Hope. Can't we save this till we get to the yard, Mr. Holmes? 
The marks in the road showed me that the horse had wandered on slightly between arriving and departing, and that would never have happened if anyone had been in charge of it. It was clear from the footprints that only two men were ever there, so it followed that the driver of the cab was also the murderer. But how the devil did you know my name? As I said, through the ring. It was a question of motive. Despite your clumsy attempt to implicate German radicals, it was clear that the, the murderer... The papers had been full of secret societies and the like. I thought it might throw you off the scent. Well, it didn't. Carry on, Mr. Holmes. Political assassins are only too glad to do their work and to fly, whereas this murder had been done most deliberately. So it was a private matter. Now, since a woman is usually involved somewhere in these affairs, the ring merely confirmed what I'd already decided. I wanted the last thing that villain saw to be Lucy's ring. The ring he forced on her finger. Keep it for the official statement, Hope. <sighs> so, Gregson, I did what you neglected to do. What? I telegraphed the Cleveland police for information concerning Drebber and trouble over any woman. The answer was conclusive. He had once applied for the protection of the law against one Jefferson Hope, a rival in love. Love! <coughs> love! I wish I could have seen him die. <coughs> ten, ten times over! Uh, uh, Let me doctor. examine you. Uh, Let me alone. Come on, man! Uh, I do, do what you like. Uh. We must get to Scotland Yard as quickly as we can. This man is seriously ill. How long have you known? She's been getting worse for years. Have you seen a doctor recently? Last week. What did he tell you? Now, what do you think he told me? I'm afraid he was quite correct. Oh, what do I care? I've done my work. But look, Doctor, what exactly is all this about? Mr. Hope has an aortic aneurysm. Oh. Mm, what does that mean? It means, Gregson, that he could die at any moment. Good Lord. Mm. Is that right, Doctor? Yes, quite right. It's a failure of the main blood vessel leading from the heart. It swells up and eventually bursts. There's no cure. I got it from overexposure and underfeeding. The salt like man's. I don't care how soon I go, but I should like to leave an account of this affair behind me. I don't want to be remembered as a common cutthroat. That's great. <clears throat> what do you think? Well, he's obviously seriously ill. If we take a statement from him now, it's quite likely to be thrown out of court as unreliable. Mm, or coerced. Mm. On the other hand... Exactly. Mm. Jefferson Hope. I am Inspector Tobias Gregson, and this gentleman is Inspector Giles Lestrade. Mm. You are at liberty to make your statement to us, but I am obliged to warn you that it will be taken down and may be presented in evidence at your trial. Very well. I'm on the brink of the grave. I'm not likely to lie to you. Every word I say is the absolute truth. I have to start some 40 years ago. In the whole world, I doubt if there's a more dreadful place in the great Central American desert. It's nothing but death, desolation. But if you'd been there, gentlemen, on one particular day all those years back, you'd have seen something moving. Something alive. Hush, child, hush. Shh, that's it. There's no sense in crying now, child. It ain't gonna help. The man's name was John Ferrier. The child was called Lucy. Shh, baby, shh. We'll find a river by and by. By and by. John Ferrier told me once that he carried that baby three days, three nights across the plains. Both their parents were dead, along with the rest of the wagon train. And he looked after her like she was his own. But they never did find that river. Here, drink this. Oh, slowly. Just a sip. That's it. A baby. She's asleep. Peaceful as you like. God be praised. Amen. Amen. Shh, don't try to speak. You're safe now. Safe? But what are you people doing in this wilderness? Who are you? We are the persecuted children of God, the chosen ones of the angel Morona. We are the people of the holy Joseph Smith and his prophet. God in heaven, you're the Mormons. We are the Mormons. Ten thousand of them there were, trekking across the desert, 
looking for their promised land. And they'd found John Ferrier and the babe. I suppose you'd have to call it a miracle. As soon as he was able to walk, he was taken to one particular wagon. It was bigger and finer than the rest. Welcome, John Ferrier. I have been told your story by Brother Stangerson, who found you and to whom you owe your life and that of the child. I'm grateful to him, to all of you. Are you the leader? We are led by the hand of God. Amen. Amen. Of course. If we take you with us, it can only be as believers in our own creed. We shall have no wolves in our fold. Will you come with us on these terms? I guess I'll come with you on any terms. Brother Stangerson? Prophet? Let it be your task to teach him our holy creed. Come, Brother Ferrier. You're in my care now. My wives will see to your needs. Brother Stangerson. Remember that now and forever you are one of us. Brigham Young has said it, and he speaks with the voice of Joseph Smith, which is the voice of God. I guess we can skip a good few years. John Ferrier recovered from his ordeal well enough. Distinguished himself as a guide, hunter. Lucy, well, I'll come to Lucy in a minute or so. When they finally stopped their wanderings, Ferrier was granted as good a stretch of land as any of the men, save Young, of course, and excepting the four elders, Kemble, Johnson, Stangerson, and Drebber. His name was known, respected, but for all the respect, there was one thing about John Ferrier that offended the rest of the Mormons. I will not do it, Lucy. I've gone along with all the rest, but that... Now don't distress yourself, Father. They cannot compel you. Oh, you're right, child. Let them say what they will. What are they saying? They say I'm not a true follower of the faith. Or that I care only for money. And the real reason I refuse to take any wives is because I begrudge the expense. The friendlier ones say I hold myself single in memory of a long-lost love who pined away on the shores of the Atlantic. Oh, how romantic. You sweet child. <laughs> oh, the fair Lucy was no longer a child. I was a prospector in those days. Come to the city to raise capital to work some loads I discovered. That day I met Lucy. I don't know, gentlemen. It was as if a whole new stretch of land had been opened up in front of my eyes that I never knew existed. And I was a strong-willed young man. Whatever I undertook, I was accustomed to success. Lucy! Uh, Jefferson! Uh, Lucy, listen. I have to go away. Go away? Well, for a month. Two at the most. T two months? No, you can't. I'll die. <laughs> You'll not die. But... But two months at the most... And then I'll come back. I'll ask you to be mine. Oh, Jefferson. Look, your father has given me his consent. Well, of course. If you and father have arranged it all between you, there's no more to be said. So you will? <laughs> Look, the longer I stay, the harder it'll be to go. Goodbye. Bye, Lucy. In two months, you'll see me. Goodbye, my love. Less than two months. Oh, Jefferson. Oh, if I'd known, if I'd had the smallest suspicion, do you think I would have ridden away like that? Do you? Do you? <laughs> Easy. <coughs> Here, drink this. Here. <gasps> Slowly. <sighs> yeah, I, uh, I think we should postpone <sighs> this. No. <sighs> no, I must continue. Doctor, <coughs> what's your opinion? I think we should carry on. But before we do... Uh, what, are, what are you giving him? I must have the name of that powder, Dr. Watson. It's only a mild painkiller. Drink it down in one. Good. <sighs> Thank you, Doctor. All right. You have to understand that to hold any kind of unorthodox opinion was a dangerous matter among the Mormons. To fall foul of the elders was a terrible thing. Close the door, if you please. Yes, Brother Young. My daughter has gone to the city, but I could prepare some refreshments. It is of your daughter that I wish to speak. Lucy.
There are stories of her which I would fain disbelieve, stories that she is sealed to some Gentile. What is the thirteenth rule in the code of the Saint Joseph Smith? You claim to be a loyal member of the church, wise in its teachings. What is the thirteenth rule? Let every maiden of the true faith marry one of the elect. For if she marry a Gentile, she commits a grievous sin. Your daughter has found favor in the eyes of many who are high in the land. Stangerson has a son. Drebber has a son. They are young and rich and of the true faith. Let her choose between them. You must give us time. Lucy is scarce of an age to marry. We give you time. We give you one month. A month? At the end of thirty days, she shall make her choice. And if she will not, then I will do so for her. Good day to you, brother. A month. I had been gone scarce three weeks. I discovered later that Ferrier sent a message after me. The very next day. It was that same day that he arrived home to find two young men in possession of his sitting room. I guess you don't know us, brother. This here is Enoch, the son of Elder Drebber. Greetings, brother. And I'm Joseph Stangerson. I traveled with you when I was just a lad, when the Lord stretched out his hand and gathered you into the true fold. As he will all the nations in his own good time, he grindeth slowly but exceeding small. Amen, Brother Drebber. I'd guessed who you were. Then you must surely know why we're here. Oh, I know your purpose right enough. As I have only four wives, and Brother Drebber here has seven, it appears to me that my claim is the stronger. The question is not how many we have, but how many we can keep. I'm the richer man. Uh, but my prospects are better. I'm your elder and higher in the church. Hmm. What say you, Brother Ferrier? I say this. I don't want to see either of your faces again. What? Are you aware what an honor it is to marry the son of an elder? I'm aware that there are two ways out of this room. There's the door and there's the window. Which do you care to use? You have defied the prophet and the holy four. You'll regret this to the end of your days. I knew nothing at all of this. The power of the holy four stretched wider and deeper than John Ferrier could ever suspect. His message never reached me. Good morning, Father. I was wondering if I might... What in the world is the matter? Nothing, child. Wait for me in the sitting room. What is that paper? What does it say? Show it to me, Father. Here. I found it pinned to the bedclothes. It was there when I woke. Twenty-nine days. Oh, my God. Next morning, they found the number 28 scrawled with a burnt stick in the very center of their ceiling. That night, Ferrier sat up with his gun. He saw nothing, heard nothing. Yet in the morning, a great 27 had been painted on the outside of their front door. And so it went on. 20 changed to 15, 15 to 10, 10 to 5. And still they waited in vain. For me. In fact, I was on my way back to them. My business over and done with. And not a care in my heart. Oh, oh boy. Oh. Drop oh. your rifle! Man said to drop your rifle. Get off your horse. He sure doesn't look much, does he, brother? Look, if you're planning to... Oh! <laughs> That's enough, Drebber. Drebber? I'll remember that name. If you're planning to rob me, get on with it. Oh, we're planning to rob you, all right. At least ways one of us is. But not yet. In four days' time. <laughs> what do you mean? Four days. Jefferson Hope. You know me. What is this? Keep your filthy, heathen hands off the farrier girl. Lucy. Yeah. She's meant for better than you, Hope. Me, for instance. Or, or my friend here. Pretty soon that trim little body's gonna be cuddling up to one of us. You 
bastard! You will show respect to us. I am Joseph Stangerson, first son of Elder Stangerson. When you speak to me, you speak to the Prophet himself. Stangerson? Drebber and Stangerson. That for your Prophet! And I hoped you were going to be reasonable. Teach him how to be reasonable, Brother Drebber. My pleasure, Brother Stangerson. Oh. Oh. They left me for dead. By the time they'd finished with me, I wasn't far off it. But the thought of one of them, with my Lucy, who's there? I warn you, I'm armed. Quiet! For the love of heaven! Good God, you nearly have my gun in your face! For pity's sake, get me inside! They're all around the house! The devil they are! Here, take my arm! Give me something to drink. Oh, I got it. Oh! Yeah. this to you. Drebber, Stangerson, I've got to get both of you away. Tonight. I can be dressed in a moment. What should we take? Food. And as much water as we can manage. I'll see you there. Hurry, buddy. <sighs> John? What is it, son? This house, the farm. Everything you've worked for. What's that to me? Give me a hand with the food. The watchers were concentrating on the front and the rear of the house. We climbed out the side window while the moon was hidden by the clouds. And we made it safely to the edge of the cornfield. Oh, thank God. We've done it. They're everywhere. Not a sound. to seven. Seven to five. What news? If the girl remains stubborn, we strike tomorrow at midnight. The prophet's orders. <laughs> then there'll be some fun. <laughs> All right, brother. I'll tell the others. Oh, is it safe to move on? We must. Everything depends on speed. I had three horses waiting. All night we kept moving. All next day. Most of the next. But then our food was gone. I wasn't worried, though. There was game of plenty in the mountains. We were high up above sea level. And the air was bitter. Let me go. No. No, you rest while you can. I'll not be long. Be back before full dark? Depend on it. We'll have a quick meal and move on. This time tomorrow, we'll be in Carson City. And safe. I had to tramp a couple of miles or more before I had any luck with my rifle. The last of the light was dying by the time I got back. Hello? Lucy? John? We'll feast tonight! Oh, sweet Jesus. Lucy? Lucy! I found John Ferrier at the edge of the clearing. He'd been beaten like an animal and shot. Lucy wasn't there. Were you able to build up any picture of what happened? Not until the next morning. I saw the tracks. A lot of men on horseback. They'd come up behind us along the path and they'd turned back towards Salt Lake City. They'd taken our horses but I set off after them. How long did it take you? Six days. By the time I reached the city, I must have looked a wild sight. I stayed in the shadows. The streets were hung with flags. 
They were celebrating the marriage of an elder son. All I heard was talk about the great rivalry between these two fine young men. On the very day I got there, the prophet had given my Lucy to Enoch Drebber. What did you do? I went back into the mountains. I suppose I must have lost my senses for a time. When I came to myself, I returned to the city. I knew what I'd find there. I knew she was dead. Dead of grief and shame. Some of Drebber's other wives were keeping vigil over her body. I took his ring from her finger. I'd not have her buried in Drebber's ring. And I vowed I'd not rest till I'd made them pay for what they'd done to my love. The rest is easily told. There was a great split among the chosen people. Many gave up to faith. Drebber, Stangerson among them. John Ferrier's fortune had made Drebber a rich man. But for some reason, he and Stangerson stuck to each other's company and set off to travel together. They were rich and I was poor. But I dogged them. I followed them across two continents. Sometimes I nearly caught up with them. Other times I lost the trail for long stretches. But always, I kept going. Always. Just how long has this business been going on? <laughs> Twenty years. Twenty years. And eventually I tracked them here, London. Where you obtained employment as a cab driver? Wherever they went, I was always at their heels. At first, I planned to surprise them. I reckon they thought I was dead years before. But they somehow got wind of me. They were cunning. Never went out alone, hardly ever after nightfall. And I thought it was all up. I knew I had no chance against the two of them together if they were on guard. But they got careless. Drebber had taken to drink. It wasn't only to drink. In the end, it was a woman that did for him. I liked that. It was fitting. I'd sat in my cab and watched when the two of them were thrown out of that boarding house. I knew why. And I sat and watched again when Drebber went back after that pretty face and her brother lashed into him in the street. And I tell you, I enjoyed that. I waited till the boy had finished with him. And I drove up to where Drebber was lying in the gutter. Charpentier's cab. <laughs> I didn't believe him. Now, Drebber didn't recognize me. He was practically out on his feet from drink and the thrashing he'd had. He asked me to take him to his hotel. But you didn't. You took him to an empty house in the Brixton Road. I'd found it weeks before. I knew I could get inside easy enough when the time came. And I had him on his own. At last. This is my hotel. Cabby. It's damn dark here. Now, Enoch Drebber. Huh? Who am I? What? What do you mean? Who, who are you? I, I don't know you. I, I've never seen... Ah. Uh, uh. <laughs> I'd always known that vengeance would be sweet, gentlemen. But I'd never hoped for the contentment of soul that I felt at that moment. It was like madness. <laughs> the pulses in my temples beat like sledgehammers. And I believe I'd have had some sort of fit if the blood hadn't gushed from my nose and relieved me. Keep away from me, Hope. You're insane. Look at this ring, Drebber. This is the ring that killed Lucy Ferrier when you forced it on her finger and dragged her off to your shameless harem. No, no. Now look at it. It'll be the last thing you ever do look at. Would you murder me? I'm no murderer. We'll let the high God judge between us. There are two pills in this box. Choose and eat. No, no. There's death in one and life in the other. No. I'll take what you leave. No. Choose! No. Choose! Let's see if there's justice on the earth or if we're ruled by chance. Now choose! By God, I will murder you where you stand! Ah. 
Very well. It's done. Now, this one's for me. <laughs> I've beaten you, Jefferson Hope. Justice on Earth. <laughs> I'll watch you die like the stinking rat you are. <laughs> That's how Andy Drebber came to his end. Blood was still streaming from my nose, but I felt light-hearted, mischievous. I wrote up rock on the wall and with a cigar, and I looked at him for a spell, and then I got out. When did you discover that you'd lost the ring? That ring was all I had of my Lucy. I had to have it back. I hadn't gone far. I left the cab on a side street and walked up to the house. Straight into one of your constables. PC John Rams. I fear he will not rise in the force. You pretended to be drunk. He paid me no heed. All I could think of was that I'd lost Lucy's ring. And I saw your advertisement. Evening paper. Ah, yes. Who was your accomplice who visited Baker Street? Accomplice? What's this, Mr. Holmes? Why haven't you mentioned this before? The zeal of the official force, eh, Watson? <laughs> and this is not relevant to your inquiries, Gregson. I'll wager the man had nothing to do with the killings. Nothing? Nothing, I swear it. Now, Mr. Holmes, I can tell you my secrets, but I don't get other people into trouble. But I think you'll own he did it smartly. Not a doubt of that. Let's get back to the matter in hand here. Joseph Stangerson wasn't poisoned. He was stabbed to the heart. He begged me for his life. Cried like a woman. Told me I had no quarrel with him. He hadn't touched the girl. And they killed her father. He wouldn't take his chance with the pills. He went for my throat. It was self-defense. The outcome would have been the same in any case. The Providence would never have allowed his guilty hand to pick out anything but the poison. And that's the whole of my story. You may consider me to be a murderer, but I say I'm just as much an officer of justice as you are. Someone had said to me two weeks ago that I was going to find myself caught up in a murder investigation. What an extraordinary affair. Thank you, Doctor. <coughs> yes, it's even more extraordinary than you know. Uh -huh. Look at this. It's from Gregson. Arrived just before dinner. Good Lord. That's incredible. He must have died while we were actually on the way back here. He hung on to life until his story was told. Power of the mind. Amazing. Huh? Making his statement was as important to him as exacting his revenge. You really think so? Oh, yes, yes. What other reason could he have had for giving himself up? What did you say? Oh, Watson, think. Wiggins led Hope to the very same rooms where, not 12 hours before, his accomplice had been given a patently false wedding ring. He must have known it was a trap. But he fought like a cornered tiger. Oh, what a, a picturesque vocabulary you do possess. <laughs> well, perhaps it was bravado. Perhaps his nerve failed him at the last. Uh, I, I, I don't know. But do you recall what he said? Mm -hmm. Almost as soon as we reached the yard. Uh, yes, mm. yes. Wait a moment. Ah, uh, yeah, uh, here. Hmm? I knew I'd made a note of it. I don't care how soon I go, but I should like to leave an account of this affair behind me. 
I don't want to be remembered as a common cutthroat. I don't want to be remembered as a common cutthroat. Mm. He came here knowing he would almost certainly be arrested because he desperately wanted his story on record. All that. Twenty years. For a woman. Holmes? Gregson and Lestrade will be furious at his death. <laughs> Where will their grand advertisement be now? Huh? <laughs> I wouldn't have missed this business for anything. <laughs> what was it you called it? A study in scarlet. Yes, I must have been in one of my more lurid moods. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm enormously grateful to you for allowing me to be in on it. Well, I only hope it hasn't placed too great a strain on your health. By no means. I feel better this evening than I have for months. Well, I'm delighted to hear it. A helping of the bazaar is always invigorating, I think. <laughs> I meant what I said, you know. You really have made an exact science out of detective work. Compared to you, Gregson and Lestrade are like blind men. Mm. Your merit should be publicly recognised. You ought to publish an account of the whole affair. Uh, if you won't, I'll do it for you. Huh? I'd no idea you went in for writing. You know, I thought your literary activities were confined to compiling lists of my shortcomings. Please, let's not go through that again. I, I didn't know you then. And now you do. Come on. A study in Scarlet. I'll make a marvellous story. It has adventure, suspense, romance, everything. Well, what do you say? I say... Come in, Mrs. Hudson. The evening papers, gentlemen. <laughs> Special late edition. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, just throw them down somewhere. I hmm? shall do no such thing. There you are. Nice and tidy. Mm -hmm. Good evening, Mr. Holmes. Mm. Dr. Watson. Oh. <laughs> you shouldn't tease her. She's a good woman. She's uh, a good woman. <laughs> I was once introduced to a woman universally praised for her charity work amongst the poor. She subsequently proved to have dispatched three wealthy husbands by methods I will not relate so soon after your consumption of Mrs. Hudson's baked apple dumplings. <laughs> I'm most grateful. Mm. Look, what were you about to say? Holmes, what's wrong? Listen to this. The public have lost a sensational treat through the sudden death of the suspected murderer, Jefferson Hope. Mm, that news got out quickly. Uh, Gregson and Lestrade. I might have known they'd find a way to transmute their failure into success and their mediocrity into genius. <laughs> they couldn't wait to parade themselves before their adoring public and soak up its applause. Oh, now come on. It is an open secret that the credit for the capture of this vicious and dangerous criminal belongs entirely to the well-known Scotland Yard officials, Messrs Lestrade and Gregson. The man was apprehended. Well, yeah. Read it for yourself. The man was apprehended in the rooms of a certain Mr. Sherlock Holmes, hmm. who, under their instruction, has himself shown some small talent as an amateur detective. Under their instruction. Keep, keep reading. Keep reading. With such teachers, Mr. Holmes may well hope in the fullness of time, to attain some degree of their skill and professional expertise. Didn't I tell you so before we started? This is outrageous. Mm. I'm going to bed. This whole report is a downright tissue of lies. I've a good mind to go straight round to Fleet Street and demand that they publish a retraction when they've heard my version of the facts. Watson. Yes? Why don't you put these newfound energies to more productive use? I beg your pardon? Write your book, Doctor. Write your book. That was part two of A Study in Scarlet by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Dramatised in two parts by Bert Cools, with Clive Merrison as Sherlock Holmes and Michael Williams as Dr. John Watson. Jefferson Hope was played by Shane Rimmer, Joseph Stangerson by Matt Zimmerman, Enoch Dreber by Ed Bishop, Inspector Lestrade by Donald G, and Inspector Gregson by John Moffat. Peter Carlyle played Brigham Young, Alice Arnold, Lucy, Christopher Good, John Ferrier, 
Alan Dean, Wiggins, Anna Cropper, Mrs. Hudson, Marcia King, Madame Charpentier, Jane Slavin, Alice, and John Bull, Stangerson Sr. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The violinist was Alexander Balanescu. A Study in Scarlet was directed by Ian Cottrell and produced by David Johnston. <laughs>